just last week I was in uh, Rome. I was there to give some papers and some lectures, and I stayed at one of my favorite places, which is the North American College in Rome. I've been there a couple times as a scholar in residence. They had me in uh, a wonderful guest room on the fifth floor, the top floor of the North American. As I turned my head from my desk, I looked out the window, and there was, gleaming in the Roman sky, the Dome of St. Peter's. And uh, I just spent a lot of time uh, meditating on the Dome of St. Peter's. And what always strikes me, it struck me again this time, was the Dome of St. Peter's is basically the most uh, elaborately decorated and famous grave marker in the world because it marks the site of the burial of um, St. Peter, this uh, Galilean fisherman who found himself against all expectations, including very much his own, at the end of his life in the center of the, uh, the Roman Empire. Um, Peter came there, of course, to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted that message to go out to all the world, and he went to the center of the empire to do just that. One of his companions, according to tradition, was a young man named Mark, the author of the first gospel. Mark was most likely a Palestinian Jew who knew enough Latin and Greek to help Peter make his way in the wider world. They say, therefore, Mark's gospel represents the content and even the sort of rhythms of Peter's preaching. Peter's very prominent, by the way, in Mark's Gospel, and so you can see a reflection of, of Peter's own uh, preaching. Well, Mark's Gospel begins with this line, the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, all that's coded language, though we're going to miss it today. We see it as kind of a blandly spiritual line. But euangelion was the Greek word that Mark used, glad tidings. A good, you know, angel is like a, a messenger. Good message. Well, see, that word was used to describe an imperial victory. When Caesar won a battle, he would send evangelists out ahead of him. That's where the word comes from. Declaring the good news that Caesar won this great battle. Caesar is the victor. What he's saying is that the real euangelion, the real gospel, has nothing to do with Caesar. It has to do with someone that Caesar put to death and whom God raised from the dead. It has to do with this Jesus. And just to rub it in, unless we miss the point, he calls him the huios tuteu in his Greek, which means the Son of God. Well, see, we, we know that from the long doctrinal tradition. Of course, he's the Son of God. But see, in that time, in that place, those were fighting words because huios tuteu was a title for Caesar. Go back to Julius Caesar, who was a you know, kind of tough street politician. After his death, he's called a god which is why his adopted son, Augustus, becomes the Weos Tutau. He becomes the son of the God, you know. Well, then the Caesars after him picked up that title. We see what Mark is saying. And you know, I'm, I'm guessing he's catching this from Peter's preaching. Is he saying, no, no, the true son of God is not Caesar or any of his grubby successors. It's this Jesus whom Caesar put to death. Well, once we see language like that, and if it is really reflective of Peter's preaching, we're not all that surprised that these people were very often in very hot water. Um, the year 64, roughly, there's the great um, uh, fire in Rome, and Nero is casting about for scapegoats, and he uh, lights upon the Christians. And that's when, when uh, Peter is rounded up. Paul maybe is killed you know, a bit later, but still part of that general persecution. Peter's rounded up, and uh, I thought of this too when I was sitting in my room on the Janiculum Hill. Peter probably was in the Trastevere neighborhood today, which is just sort of south of the Janiculum, right across from the uh, Jewish synagogue in Rome today, which John Paul II visited famously back in the 1980s. But that was the Jewish quarter back in the first century. So most likely, Peter and Mark and, and Paul and the first uh, Christians were in that area. So Peter is um, arrested, he's taken from there, maybe on foot, maybe by cart, who knows, but up past the geniculum to um, Nero's Circus, which was a um, racetrack that, that was right between the geniculum hill and the Vatican hill, so like in this little valley. And there Peter was um, crucified for the entertainment of the crowd. Tradition says upside down because he didn't feel worthy of dying the way Jesus did. It's very... Uh, likely that the last thing on earth that Peter saw was an obelisk that stood on the spina or the spine of that track. It was an obelisk brought back to Rome by Augustus from Egypt. 
that obelisk today stands in the very center of St. Peter's Square. And it's very moving. Every time you look at that, I think that's probably the last thing that Peter saw as he died. Peter died and he was taken down from the cross and he was buried in a little cemetery uh, upon which now is built uh, St. Peter's Basilica. Now, whenever I reflect on this, whenever I think about it, um, here's what strikes me. Nero, in his time, I mean, was a big dealer. He was the Roman emperor. He's the king of the world. Nero, exercising this arbitrary authority, puts to death this, uh, this Galilean fisherman. Who would have guessed that 2,000 years later, Nero, I mean, it's just an ancient memory. Nero's palace is in ruins. Nero's empire, long gone. But the successor of Peter is right there. I mean, he lives in the apostolic palace. I saw him when I was in Rome. I, he came out for the Sunday uh, blessing, and I saw him. The empire that has, um, has grown from those early Christian roots now spans the whole world and includes well over a billion people. I'm sure that Nero and his, uh, his henchmen back in the first century laughed when they heard Christians refer to Jesus, this crucified carpenter, as the Lord. Curios. No, Kaiser Curios. Caesar was the Lord. They would have laughed at that. See, whenever I look over and see that dome of St. Peter's, I think we Christians had the last laugh. 